How many people in this room know what this fish is? Who can identify this fish? Oh, Rick can identify. Wow, I'm impressed. A few of you, okay. Yeah, it's not I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is a delta smelt, obviously. Um, so what words pop to mind when you um, think of delta smelt? Uh, friendly little critter, something you want to pet, you know. Uh, so if somebody want to give me a word that pops to mind when you think of delta smelt? And endemic. Oh, what a great word. Controversial. Controversial. There we go. Uh, yeah, it's all those things. That's the kind of uh, things that we're we're, we're dealing with uh, with the delta smelt. And um, I was tempted to write a whole bunch of things on the board in this one. I don't think I will. Um, so, uh, but obviously, some of you at least know the delta smelt's a small, rare fish that's highly controversial because it's, it's in the middle of California's water distribution system. You can't do anything with water in California unless you deal with delta smelt, at least nothing that involves the, the delta. Um, and what I want to start this lecture with is a story of my involvement with this fish. I like to, this is a story, is one, I haven't been very good about telling it, so I thought I'd try now. Um, which It shows the power of the Endangered Species Act. It shows how the smelt has been controversial from the very beginning. And it illustrates how an academic like myself can influence policy, even though at the time I was starting to get involved in this uh, 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 endeavor to, with the smelt, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, and. Uh, it starts this way. In the mid-1970s, I was working on the first edition of my book on California fish, Inland Fishes of California, which is a book that summarizes everything that's known about fish in California. Um, and one of the, some of the biggest gaps in my knowledge at that time were the native fishes, uh, the Delta smelt in particular. So in 1974, I went out a couple of times in the Delta on a fishing game sampling boat. Uh, this sampling was part of their fall bidwater trawl program, but it's still going on. Um, and the program was aimed at sampling juvenile striped bass. At that time in the Delta, the only fish that mattered really were striped bass. The, the, all the water decisions, all the decisions in the Delta were made to, to favor striped bass because it was the El Primo game fish in, in the system. That's really what people cared about. Nobody even knew much about the smelt. Uh, and the fact the fishing aid department was concerned that the big pumps that were just getting online in the South Delta were going to affect bass populations. So they were worried about the reductions in Delta outflow affecting bass. But what impressed me when I got on that boat and noticed the sampling was how many smelt there were in, those, in their samples, uh, both Delta and long fish smelt, sometimes hundreds at a single trawl. And so, you know, one thing, I'm an assistant professor going up for tenure. Uh, it's good to work on something common and that you can get some, you can some quick publications out of. So I said, okay, I will, uh, this seems like a logical thing to work with. And so it also gave me a chance to fill in the information gaps in my, in my book. So I asked Lee Miller, who was the biologist in charge, could he start saving smelt for me so that I could do a basic life history study. So Lee said, he's glad to do it. A few months later, a fishing game truck pulls up at the loading zone on Briggs Hall, where my lab was at that time, and it literally was a one-ton truck piled high with crates full of smelt, jars and jars of pickled smelt. Um, and um, fortunately, Lee also realized that he was, he was interested, got interested in the smelt, so he said, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll hire one of your students as, as full-time as a seasonal aide to help you sort these samples. That was Bruce Bakken, and that resulted in my becoming the world's expert on Delta smelt, uh, not that anyone at the time really cared. Um, but this is basically what we found out about the smelt. First off, its entire life is in the estuary, it's no place else. Um, it spawns in fresh water, it likes to live in brackish water, but it spawns in fresh water. It has a one year life cycle. Think about that, it's pretty remarkable for a fish that lives in a dynamic environment. It means that at any time, the conditions somewhere in the estuary, conditions are right for that fish. Um, it's very low fecundity, not, you know, it produces very few eggs, so it, it doesn't reproduce at a very rapid rate. Uh, it eats zooplankton, it doesn't care what kind of zooplankton, it'll eat native or non-native species. Uh, but and it's also rarely eaten by other fish. Uh, it's semi-transparent, it's got behavior that makes it almost invisible. So, um, 
this was the basic life history information that we had covered. I started tracking it through time as well. Because in 1979, I started my own sampling program studying the fishes of Susun Marsh, uh, which is just downstream from the delta. And this program involved mo monthly sampling of fish, and in those monthly samples were delta smelt. Um, and when I started out, just as in the fishing game sampling, delta smelt were pretty common in our samples. Um, but then around the mid-1980s, 1985, 86, I started noticing we weren't getting very many smelt anymore. Um, and so this prompted me to start looking at the data from all these other sampling programs that were going on in the, in the estuary. And there I found the same trend. The delta smelt populations were crashing. Um, and th this... Um, this was coincident well, both with a long-term drought that was occurring at the time and with a steady increase in exports from the pumps in the South Delta. So with the help of Bruce Herbold, who just retired from US EPA, which shows you how long it's been, we've been working on this thing, uh, I wrote up, um, wrote up an analysis of the situation and started circling drafts of a paper. Uh, then at the same time, in August 1989, I'd taken a sabbatic leave um, to do some serious writing, but instead of writing my book, which I was supposed to be doing, or another version of the book, I submitted a petition to list the Delta smelt as a threatened species under the State Endangered Species Act. My reasoning for this was as follows. Here's, I'm, I'm, I'm an academic, but I was the only person that knew much about smelt. I was, you know, as I said, the world's expert on Delta smell at the time. So it was my responsibility to let people know this fish was in serious trouble. You know, I should have get up there and said, I know about the fish, I've got to tell everybody about it. Um, but since I had some inkling that the petition could be controversial, I only filed it with the state, figuring the Cal it was a California problem. And I also knew that the State Endangered Species Act was much weaker than the Federal Act. And so, presumably that would diffuse the controversy a little bit because you didn't have to do, be quite so stringent to worry about uh, take permit permits and things of this nature. Uh, so, and I just thought there would be more flexibility in dealing with water issues if it was only listed under the state act. Well, the decision making body for the petition was the State Fish and Game Commission which is made up of businessmen who like to hunt and fish. These are not biologists, they're political appointees to this uh, um, decision-making body. And their major interest really is fishing, hunting and fishing regulations. Uh, so in August 1990, I was invited to attend a commission meeting in Sacramento to discuss the petition. I must admit, I walk into this room, it's a small auditorium, and find it's packed. Packed, every major environmental group had representatives there. Most of the water agencies and interests had, had, um, had representatives there. I realized at that point, maybe this was a little more than I was asking for. Uh, so I made a short presentation about the biology of the smell and why I thought it was in trouble. And it was just followed by questions and a discussion uh, by the commissioners. Well, finally, one of the commissioners asked me something Think like that improving conditions for Delta smelt will require changing the operation of the pumps in the South Delta. Uh, and I replied something like, well, yeah, I, I think it's likely. Um, you know, there, it's, it's a, there's an association here. And the response was almost immediate on the part of that particular commissioner, something like, well, we really can't list the smelt then, can we? Because you certainly can't interfere with the water supply. Uh, and the commissioners were all sort of nodding their heads in agreement. And that about that time, the, the chair of the commission started asking for a vote. And the, the commission's lawyer at that point stood up and said, uh, gentlemen, you cannot use this as a reason for not listing the species that will interfere with export of water from the Delta. Um, and so the commission, the commissioners then asked the lawyer, well, what's a good reason <laughs> for not listing the smelt? And they said, well, you can say you have insufficient information to list the species. So they said, that sounds like a good reason. All in favor, aye. And, and the uh, decision not to list was unanimous. Um, well, at this point, I realized I wasn't really equipped to deal with the issue. Fortunately, the local chapter of the American Fisheries Society had asked me three months earlier if they could file the petition with the federal government to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So they took what I had, had written and converted it into the federal format. I somewhat reluctantly agreed. I really didn't want, thought this was, idealistically thought this was a state issue and the state really should be in charge of handling it. 
But then in 1993, the Delta smelt was listed as a threatened species by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And of course, ironically, the Fish and Game Commission then turned around and immediately listed it as a state species as well, because they knew they would be left out of, just not be a player in the game if uh, it wasn't listed by the state. Well, once the smelt was listed, I was asked by the Fish and Wildlife Service to head up a team to write the recovery plan. And um, during that early discussion of how to do this, I asked if we could make it a recovery plan for declining native fishes of the Delta. Because my data and, the, and that, I'd taken all these big data sets and noticed that it wasn't just the Delta smelt that was in decline, and that there were other species out there that seemed to be in trouble uh, as well. So everybody thought doing a Delta native fishes recovery plan was a great idea. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe even prevent the listing of some of these other species. So we completed this document in a year. I, that was just, I'm now looking in retrospect, this is pretty amazing. We had regular meetings, there are public meetings, uh, sometimes angry people were at the pair of these meetings, but and we produced this nice thick document with life history information on all these uh, various species that are listed here. Uh, and uh, we finished it up, turned it into the Fish and Wildlife Service, they said thank you. The document was put back on a high shelf in a back office and pretty much ignored. Um, because it turns out that you know, the listing is so important that if it's not listed, you, there's no reason to work on, on the fish. You can't work on them. The agencies are so busy with listed species, they don't have time for the unlisted ones in order to prevent them from being listed. Um, well, meanwhile, exports and diversions continued to increase, environmental conditions continued to deteriorate, the smelt continued to decline, and one by one, the, the species in the Delta native fishes recovery plan have been listed. And all the, everything with an asterisk up there is now also listed under the federal ESA. Um, and um, I've done such a great job saving native fish that the Delta smelt is closer to extinction now than ever and the other delta fishes are waiting in the queue. So, you know, I've attempted to create a graph showing my number of publications versus the status of fish in California. <laughs> and there's a, a, a direct negative correlation. Um, <laughs> But, and the fact that the, the fate of the smelt and other fishes is mostly being decided in the courtrooms these days. Um, but the listing has given the Fish and Wildlife Service, of course, considerable control over exports. Um, and just last week, you know, they, they ordered a reduction uh, in pumping, uh, the export pumping, because the number of smelt being killed by the pumps had reached um, uh, close to the allowable limit. So the Delta smelt continues to be controversial and it continues to be a scapegoat for, for water management. Um, this is, it's regarded as the ultimate fish, if you go to the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley, it's regarded as the evil incarnate, uh, the reason that there's not enough water for farming, um, or at least so, so some people say. But it does reflect this general problem we have with our water in California. So what about the co-equal goals? This is, you heard um, that talked about, uh, and yet, of course it's the mission of the Delta Stewardship Council to meet the co-equal goals of water supply reliability and water, water for the environment. And really that water for the environment translates to water for fish because that's what we know. That's where the data is. And it's, um, uh, and, and the dish, fish sort of are the, are the most emblematic species. But one thing we have to realize when we talk about co-equal goals, it's very hard for fish to be co-equal. Uh, and for, because, again, this, this is from Jay's talk here, this, this slide, you see that the, um, uh, that, you know, the, the, the fish are mostly up in Northern California, that's where all the water is, and the water demand is down here in, in Southern California and in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and that obviously presents a very difficult situation for the fish, especially when you look at the, ne the next map, it shows you all the dams and canals and things in the state. You know, we, we're the hydro, we're the society that has this hydrodynamic system that takes water, moves water everywhere throughout the state. It's a really, really quite an amazing, amazing system, but it's very hard on the fish. Um, and so the fish are starting from a low point when you're talking about co goals. And you realize this even more when you start looking at uh, this, this map right here where you see all that red is um, 
habitat that used to be available to salmon that's now behind dams they can no longer get to. Or you start looking at, or you look at the yellow on this area right here, which is all the former wetlands that used to be primary habitat for fish and other native species. So when you talk about co-equal goals, you have to realize it's co-equal, but not really. The, the water people have a lot of water they've been taking out of the system, and not just from the delta pumps, but from all the diversions. The urban and water users are taking a lot of water out. The fish have always gotten the short end of the stick. So they're starting now from a very low point. Um, and you can tell this because, well, first of all, I should point out about these fish. 79% uh, of our native fishes are found only in the California region. We have an endemic fauna. Just like the Delta smelt is found only in the Delta, most of the fish in California are found only in California. So these are California problems. Just as the, most of the water that we use distributed around the state originates in the state, the fish are there as well. So this gives us a special responsibility is one way uh, I look at it. And here are some of our uh, endemic fishes, hitch, tule perch, sacramento perch, and so forth. Um, and, the, and of course our state fish, the golden trout, uh, and some suckers. Uh, about 73% though of these fishes are in decline. This is a paper that we published um, a year or so ago uh, about them, we, which we analyzed the status of all every fish species in the state. 23% of these fish are already listed. Um, there's 122 species in the state, 23% are listed. And we recommended listing in a report we did for another 22%. Another 28% are vulnerable, which means they're on the path to listing or being or towards extinction. Where only 27% were we regarded as being reasonably secure. In other words, 73% of the fish in California are in trouble. Um, and these declining species are not just species like Delta smelt. They're also species that includes salmon and trout. It's all these game fish we have in the state. Game fish and, and sport fish and commercial species. Um, and let's look at Chinook salmon as an example. Uh, this is the uh, Chinook salmon Central Valley trends. You say, well, this doesn't look too bad. Numbers are up, seem to be averaging around 400 to 500,000 salmon coming back every year. Um, and then you start looking at what's happened in recent years. You notice we had this tremendous decline back in 2008, 2009 when they closed the fishery. Only 40,000 fish or so came back into California. And now this year suddenly we're back up to 820,000 fish returning to California. This is a schizophrenic population. We're going up and down uh, and it's, it's highly um, uh, unpredictable uh, what's going on. Uh, and in fact, if you notice this goal up here, it says goal 990,000 fish. That's the official goal of the Central Valley Project, to restore f salmon numbers back to somewhat close to their historic numbers. And that's of wild fish, by the way, not just of hatchery fish, because in fact, what we have here, this graph mostly reflects um, the, 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 the returns of fish from the hatcheries. 90% of the fish coming back to California these days are hatchery fish, and they're mostly fall run uh, at that. Um, now you're thinking, what's, what's the problem? Well, these hatchery fish are the reason you see that these high fluctuations in numbers uh, uh, at the tail end of the graph here. They, things have to be just right for these fish. They're domestic animals essentially. We're sending them out like cows to graze in the Sierra Meadows. meadows. We're sending out these fish to graze in the meadows of the ocean and those meadows better be in really good shape and have lots of uh, stuff to eat for these fish to survive. If you have wild fish, you have a whole variety of fish going out at different times and it's much less of an issue. <coughs> so, um, this is the status of California fish is the trends um, for the last 35 years <coughs> since I've been really since I've been working on these fish. 1975 is when um, the, I finished my the, my first book on the California fishes. So this is the status as reflected in that book. And what you see in this, if you look at the purple graph, the purple line on here, which is the stable populations of fish right here. Um, the ones that I regarded as being okay. There's no, you know, we can, these, these fish are, should survive indefinitely. But, but, but back in 1975, about 60% of the fish in the state were, I regarded as being in, good, in pretty good shape. Um, today, it's somewhere between 15 and 
Likewise, and you can see the number of fish being listed, the red line. There are nine species that were listed in 1975. That was right after the Endangered Species Act was passed. Um, and we have um, uh, 28 species being listed today. Um, it's, an, it's, just, it's just another way to show it. Uh, with the yellow in the middle there showing you the species that are vulnerable, the species that could be listed or are on the path, are in decline, on the path towards extinction with the the species in the blue here being the percentages of fish <coughs> that I still regard in good shape. Obviously this is not a very great trend for the fish populations of California. And we know extinction happens. This, the thick-tailed chub, the one on the top, was once one of the most abundant fish in California. It, uh, the last one was caught in 1957. For the bull trout, the one on the bottom down here, a very nice game fish. The last one uh, was caught by one of my graduate students in 1975. He tagged it and returned it to the water, though. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, so, but we also have the, on the opposite extreme, we have a lot of alien fishes, non-native fishes, that have been introduced into the state. And they're part of the problem, obviously. Um, there are 50 species of non-native fish. They increase species richness, and they tend to dominate uh, the more disturbed environments in the state. So the, but they're, in a, they're an, initial, an additional part of the problem. Um, so the next big thing, uh, the issue coming up is we've seen increasingly how does climate change affect the fishes? Well uh, we finished a study on this last year. Uh, it's, it should be, it's going to be published shortly. Uh, and we evaluated uh, the vulnerability to extinction in the next hundred years of both native and alien species. And I won't tell you all the, the, the techniques involved in this. It's a, uh, it's a fairly controversial study in the way we did it as well. But you just have to take my word for it that the numbers that we come up with mean something. Um, and you have to recognize that climate change is going to affect fish habitat in lots of different ways. There's going to be three to six degrees rise in temperature uh, in the next 50 to 100 years. Maybe even more than that. The predictions keep changing. There'll be more rain, less snow, so more variability in flows. The snow melt, this nice regular snow melt that comes off the Sierras, that, that was a very predictable source of water, is going to become much more erratic. We'll have longer uh, droughts and bigger floods. Uh, that's almost for certain. And generally decrease summer stream flow. So again, st uh, climate change is not good for fish, even without all the infrastructure uh, we have around. So when we evaluated climate change vulnerability, uh, this is basically what we got. The black bars essentially show uh, native fishes, uh, the status of, of native fishes that go, and it goes from critically vulnerable down here all the way to likely to benefit from climate change. And what you see here is that most of the native fishes are either critical critically or highly vulnerable to climate change. That means their probability of extinction in the next hundred years is very high. Uh, and remember, this is on top of being fish that are in trouble from other reasons as well. This is just sort of adding the effects of climate change into this whole uh, issue. So 83% of the natives are in trouble. And you notice that only 19% of the alien fishes are in trouble. That tells you that our aquatic ecosystems are, from a fish perspective, are going to be shifting away from native fish and towards non-native fish. And we'll be part of this homogenization of the fish fauna of the United States that we're seeing already. Uh, the same fish we have, that you have in Connecticut, you'll have here. The same fish you find in Spain and Portugal, because that was another place I've been doing some work, you'll find here in California. Uh, is a this homo worldwide homogenization of the fauna. It's pretty boring. It'd be nice if we could hang on to our our own fish. Um, well, so what are some of the conclusions that we can draw from all this? Well, first off, of course, California has this water crisis, um, and it's a freshwater crisis. 42% of our fish are extinct or imperiled. These are fish that could be listed. 73% of the, the taxa are vulnerable to extinction, and 83% are vulnerable to climate change. That's you know, pretty depressing picture when you start thinking about what's going on. This is, you know, basically if, if present trends are continuing. So, you know, most native species are face severe decline or extinction. Uh, 
and most waterways will become dominated by non-native fish. Okay, so that's a, I repeated that because it's so, it, it's, a, it's really what our findings are showing us. But you notice in small letters here, if present trends continue. So what can we do? This is where I like, you know, I'm an optimist and that's what I like to try to talk about some of the more optimistic scenarios that we have here. Um, well, first off, uh, you, Everybody who was interested in trying to figure out what to do should read this book. This is Managing California's Water, which our previous speakers have mentioned as well, From Conflict to Reconciliation by uh, uh, the Watershed Center and PPIC. Um, but we ha what we have to do to make this work is to ship, shift to what, what our, you can call ecological reconciliation approaches, which is simply a way of saying we've got to integrate conservation into the places where we humans live and work and play. They, we, reconciliation means that trying to protect species by setting aside pristine areas is just not going to work by itself. It's one of the part of the strategies, but it's not enough. And what I can continually point out, there's really no such thing as a pristine stream in California anyway. They all have non-native fishes or invertebrates in them. They're all altered uh, one degree uh, or another. But there are lots of things driving this towards a more reconciliation approach. One is the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act. We have fisheries that depend on these native fishes. Climate change is, is happening very fast. Water demand is increasing. Um, uh, the costs of water are increasing. The costs of conservation are increasing. And there's also, the, I think there's a driver towards this in the cultural change. People are beginning, there's a greater appreciation in California of the value <coughs> of our native uh, organisms. Um, but the new realities are also face us. One is that most of the ecosystems in the state are what you can call novel ecosystems. They're highly, they're ecosystems that exist in highly disturbed environments with a high percentage of the species being non-native species. Think of the delta, for example. This is an area, the delta ecosystem today bears almost no resemblance to the historic delta. Not only physically, but also in terms of the flora and fauna. Most of the fish in the delta, depending on where you are, are non-native fish. There's the dominant aquatic plants are non-native. The dominant invertebrates are non-native. So this is a novel ecosystem. It's groups of species that have never occurred together before that are having to figure this out. How do we be an ecosystem? How do we work together? Um, the amazing thing is the critters do figure it out if you let it go, uh, if you can stabilize the system even a little bit. Um, but, and part, so part of the new and new reality is the continuous alien invasions. We're going to get new species in. We should be able to stop it, but we seem to lack the will and wherewithal to do it. Uh, zebra mussels and aquaga mussels are on their way. Uh, and they'll be in the delta, presumably in the next 20 years or so, uh, no matter how hard we try. We aren't trying terribly hard right now. Uh, and these, all our ecosystems are dominated by people. We, unfortunately, we're still faced with human population growth. It's declining, but it's still a major issue. That means increased demands uh, for goods and services. But there's also this growing realization that these ecosystems, even if they're novel ecosystems, provide a lot of services to us. They provide fisheries, they provide clean water, they do lots of things uh, that are good for us, that save us money, essentially, if you maintain uh, a, a healthy ecosystem. So what I want to talk about briefly are how do, how do we shift to ecological uh, uh, reconcilia reconciliation approaches. Um, and I have a list of things I'll talk about very briefly then maybe we can have some discussion about them as well. Um, the first one is develop a statewide strategy for aquatic conservation. This is one of the things I think the Watershed Center is hoping to concentrate on in the next few years. Uh, that's something I've been working on for, for decades in many respects. Um, it, it's not, not a sort of thing you get to have a great audience for, frankly, because it involves a lot of time and money and a lot of effort statewide to uh, manipulate environments that people maybe don't want manipulated. Uh, but it has to be systematic, it has to, we have to have a strategy that protects examples of all major habitats. Um, and ideally there will be self-sustaining populations of all native species. We can't depend on hatcheries to keep everything going. Um, and we have to think of macro fish and macro invertebrates uh, as umbrella species. I have this photograph 
of Austin Meadows in the Sierra Nevada. It's a place that has some cutthroat trout in it. It's grazed. It's uh, you see some fences on it and so forth. It's fished. This is a sort of an example of a reconciled system, ecosystem that actually works uh, in, in some respects, in most respects, and it protects a very delicate um, example with, uh, of, of a meadow system. Uh, yeah. That is clearly something that needs to be part of any statewide strategy. Um, there are a number of places in California that are very nice uh, and that are that again they're not pristine but they're very close to it and one of my favorite places right now is that I've been working with the uh, Western Rivers Conservancy on is Blue Creek a tributary to the Klamath River this is an example of a watershed that has been logged by the Green Diamond Timber Company, but they're gradually selling so the, the parts of the headwaters are in Forest Service land and Forest Service wilderness. The bottom reaches are gradually being sold to the Yurok tribe. The Yurok tribe uh, wants to make this into a Yurok tribal park and salmon sanctuary. Matter of fact, they've already declared it uh, as such. I had the good fortune to be out there this summer uh, where they actually cook salmon on the sand. But you can see that <clears throat> there's a, supposed to be a sustainable forest here and this Blue Creek uh, salmon sanctuary right at the mouth of the Klamath River. And this is the Forest Service uh, Wilderness Protected Area up here. The idea is to get this entire watershed protected as a place where you can get these trees to grow back. Most of the big trees are gone, but you can get these trees to grow back. You can recreate uh, over a number of, over a a fairly long period of time, a fu fully functioning tributary system to the Klamath River that will have all the species of salmon in it that occur in the Klamath Basin. So this is a very ambitious project um, and uh, I, I can tell you if anybody has a few million dollars in their pocket, uh, this is a very good cause. Um, <laughs> The, uh, but there's also restoration. It's still, still part of the toolbox of, of this, all this, especially focusing though on areas where you can get a lot of bang for your buck. One of the favorites, my favorites, is the one that was worked on through the Watershed Center. This is uh, the uh, restoring the, the hot Big Springs area in the Shasta River. Uh, this is again another tributary to the Klamath. The, uh, uh, Big Springs is, you know, Shasta River is a spring-fed river, and one of the biggest springs is Big Springs. It's an, absolutely an amazing plot, spot, but it's been in private hands until the Nature Conservancy bought it a few years ago. And this is what it looked like. Uh, and it's looked like, because I was up here in the 1980s as well, and it looked just like this. This is basically the result of grazing by cows that the cows are literally, this water is the same temperature all year round. It's freezing cold up here in the winter, so in the winter, the cows all move into the water and graze the vegetation in the water because it's warmer in the water than it is in the air. Obviously, that's very hard on the fish and on the habitat. The amazing thing is here that once the, the Nature Conservancy acquired it and fenced it off to get to keep the cows out, within a year it looked like this. This is truly astonishing recovery. Um, this little, nice little um, channel to the middle is deep. It's full of fish. It's full of invertebrates. They see the vegetation's come back. Here's another shot. This is before, and this is after. You know, even the clouds have left Mount Shasta. He's so happy. <laughs> uh, but again, a very rich environment for fish. You go underwater, you see these fat little salmon. Uh, that's a coho salmon there that's about as fat as you can get for that size. The, this, um, you probably can't see this too well, but this is just a mass of invertebrates here, of scuds. The bottom is just coated with food. They, these guys are like lobster to the fish. Uh, and uh, you see little Chinook salmon, big schools of them hanging out and growing extremely fast in this environment. This happened in a couple of years. So this is a, the kind of stories you like to tell, to tell there's hope. If you do get to the right place at the right time, uh, there's a lot you can do. And this is a combination of private funds from the Nature Conservancy and funding for research from UC Davis here to really demonstrate uh, what was going on, to prove to the rest of the world that this really was a positive thing. Uh, well, another uh, a uh, big thing is to reoperate dams. And the reality is most streams in California are dammed. And if we want to get these big salmon back, we have to reoperate the dams with salmon in mind. Um, this, that was refined down that picture of this little boy was taken, uh, the salmon that was taken out of the, of the San Joaquin River uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, well, we have lots of tools around for the reoperation of dams to benefit 
fish. Uh, one of them is um, section 5937 of the Fish and Game Code, which is really a, a statement of the public trust doctrine. Uh, there's the natural flow regime concept, which has been developed in the scientific literature, which tells you how to do it. And uh, right now, uh, Ted Grantham is in the, at the Watershed Center is involved in doing a statewide survey of all the dams in California to try to figure out which ones could really improve, you really could get by with improved flows below the dams by applying 5937. Because this is a law which has not been systematically applied in the state the way it needs to be. Uh, and this is what it says. It says the owner of any dam, it says any dam, sh shall allow sufficient water at all times to pass through a fishway or the absence of a fishway allow sufficient water to pass over, around, or through the dam to keep in good condition any fish that may be planted or exist below the dam. This, is, this language has been around for over a hundred years. It's pretty unequivocal uh, and it's very, very seldom used. Um, and I think now the times are changing so that it is going to be used more. And uh, probably because there's good examples now. This is Pewter Creek, right here it flows right past the Davis campus. When 5937 was applied to the flows below the Pewter Creek Diversion Dam, uh, a, a very healthy stream system has developed. And it took a relatively small amount of water. Pewter Creek, when we, before we, we developed the new flow regime, was basically drying up and was full of, where it wasn't dry, it was full of non-native fish. Today it's mostly full of native fish. And guess it was a very a relatively low water cost to the Solano Water Agency. So reoperation of dams has lots of potential. Um, um, another one, of course, is dam removal, where there are a lot of worthless dams around, there are very low value dams that we need to work on. And uh, Rebecca Kidonia is, is, in, is in the audience here. She'll be going out for dinner with us, so those who uh, are who here, you can talk to her about this. We're, we're working on a We've been working on this review forever, it seems, but on what dams you can remove in California and how you can evaluate them. Uh, but in, again, these things are never all that obvious. Uh, this is Daguerre Point Dam, uh, which is on everybody's list of dams to remove, it's on the Yuba River. And yet, when, we, when a graduate student of mine did a study there a few years back, he found the dam um, was the site of an abrupt shift in the fish fauna. Basically, it was salmon and, and steelhead and native fishes above the dam. Uh, a lot of the same below the dam, but in fewer numbers and a lot more non-native fish. So it may be that from an ecological perspective, this is the dam you'd want to keep. So this is the kind of flexibility we have to be talking about in terms of our management of dams. Another big thing that's come up, uh, and you'll certainly hear more about this uh, if you hear, hear talks from the Watershed Center folks, is restoring and managing uh, uh, floodplains. The Yellow Bypass being the classic example, but the Somnius River is a place, a uh, floodplain is one we've been studying for a number of years, and that's where these pictures are from. You've probably seen these before. The salmon, these salmon here were raised on the floodplain, these salmon here were raised in the river. Uh, the salmon get much bigger if they're on a floodplain, and they stay, hang out longer, and they go out to sea at the right times. So restoring floodplains is clearly a big thing in the future, and this is why this, we have this new project on Finn Failures Farms and Floods, restoring the Yellow Bypass. Um, if you don't know where the Yellow Bypass is, you just haven't been paying attention because you cross it every time you go, drive into Sacramento. Um, and not only is it good for the Yellow Bypass, when it's flooded, a good place for salmon, uh, it's a good place for other native fishes. Like the, the, it turns out the Sacramento split tail here is an obligate floodplain spawner. When the Yellow Bypass floods, this fish does really well. And say even the New York Times has caught up to the, onto this. It's an article in the Times in March. Um, a bold plan to reshape the Central Valley floodplains. Um, and who knows? It, it is a bold plan. It's also still, still controversial. Uh, but it's, it's a very positive thing that are happening. We also have to fix the hatchery system. The hatchery system right now is not working. Because uh, it, it's sending all these, these uh, uh, semi-domestic fish out to sea that are disrupting wild populations and then unable to respond, unable to adapt very well to changing conditions. So somehow we need a major fix in the hatchery system to make it fit uh, wild fish better <clears throat> and to make it a more continual a way to get a return on our investment there. 
And of course, as you've heard from other speakers, we've got to fix the delta. This is the water hub, a changing ecosystem. It's got precarious levees. It's got full of endangered species like the delta smelt. Um, and so what actions? can we take to improve the delta for desirable fishes? Well, you know, create the favorable flow regime. That's what everybody talks about. Uh, there's lots of ways to do that. Produ reduce the key alien species, improve water quality. And there's a whole list of things here that you can do. But they all take, in there is their individual actions that have to be coordinated. And they have to be, they, they tend to be expensive, and they have to be done in a way that's adaptive, that you learn, really learn from the experiments that we're doing out there. Um, and of course the big question is, should we build this peripheral canal, the tunnel, the pipe, the garden hose, whatever you want to call it, because this is so being sold these days as the answers to the Delta's problems, because you, you can separate water diversion from um, ecosystem services, from the from a functioning ecosystem. You can make them, make, you, you establish your co-equal goals here, you, you reach those goals by separating the two functions, the environment and the water diversion. Um, but whether that will really work or not uh, is anybody's guess. So, what will we do? And this is my last slide, so I'm asking you right now. Um, are you pessimistic or optimistic about our ability to prevent widespread extinctions of native fishes? Are the co-equal goals achievable? Um, you should think about this, and uh, at this point I'll be happy to take any answers to that question. <laughs> answers or questions will be good. <laughs> Nobody has any solutions? <laughs> Well, how many are you? How many people here are pessimistic about this whole thing? After hearing, especially after hearing me, how many are on the fence, neither pessimistic or optimistic? Any wild optimists out there? Well, I get a couple of wild optimists. Yeah. Okay. Most people not willing to commit themselves. Just like agents. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Peter, can you say a little more about what you think the new water conveyance in the Delta, if it's built, what, what that would do for native fish? The question is, what, what will the new water conveyance system do for native fishes? Well, it depends on which water conveyance system you're talking about, of course. The present water conveyance system that, you know, the Delta interests are talking about improving the, essentially the canal system across the top of the Delta. Um, that's not very good for native fish. We know that because that's what's, those things are going on right now, the native fish are in, in decline. Um, and so some kind of separation of extraction of export of water from delta functions has to be done. Um, whether or not you can do this with a peripheral, with a, with a pipe or a peripheral canal is, is really a hard question. You know, when we wrote our first report on the delta, what we said is that the best thing to do for the fish is to shut down the pumps on the South Delta. Well, that's not going to happen. So what's the next best thing you can do? And it, may, and it seems to be this, although, you know, when you talk about uh, the pipes or the canal, there's a lot of trust involved that these structures can, in fact, work the way we, th that some people think they'll work, and that we can, uh, and that if they don't work very well, we can find all other ways of, of operating them or so forth. Um, one of the aspects of the, these kind of facilities that has to be talked about is that they are a potential source of money for conservation. That you can essentially make it part of the cost of these to have a big chunk of money available that, as part of the cost of the pipes for restoration in other parts of the delta, uh, which might be good for fish. But the problem is habitat restoration only works if you have water that can interact with that habitat. So, I don't have any answers, unfortunately. I was hoping somebody here might. Any more answers? <laughs> <laughs> I have an answer. I have a question. Uh, alien fish. So, you have um, native fish and you have alien fish. How are you going to get rid of your alien fish if you've got an area that has a lot of them already and you go in to restore them with native fish? I, I don't understand what, what's going to happen to the alien fish. 
Okay, essentially, you can't get rid of the, the question of well, how, what do you do about the alien fish? You can't get rid of them. They're here. Uh, you know, if you had very limited interspaces, places, you can poison them out with, with special fish poisons. But in fact, for the most part, we have to live with them. That's why I talk about novel ecosystems. You try to manage your waterways in ways that favor as much as possible the native species, recognizing the non-natives are still going to be there. Pewter Creek is actually a good example of that because the flow regime we designed for that creek results in about, for most of the creek, about 80% native fish and 20% non-native fish. It was just the opposite before we instituted the flow regime. So a flow regime that includes for example spring spawning flows for the native fishes that really gives them a leg up on the non-native fishes um, works pretty well for Peter Creek that's now going to be tried in the San Joaquin River uh, so, and to see if that, uh, that can even work on a bigger scale but the only way we can we can deal with the problem with non-native fishes is to manage the environment in ways that favor the natives and are, that uh, don't favor the non-natives but we're, we have to live with them uh, that's that's no question about that. So my question goes back to your climate change study and the eighty-three percent threatened. In that, did you also include sea level rise and saltwater intrusion and those sorts of effects? And how big of an a part of that is the whole thing? Yeah, these the, the most of the fishes that we dealt with on that are freshwater fish. So sea level rise was less of an issue, but less of an issue. But it did include, include fish of the estuary. So sea level rise was taken into account where we needed to, because uh, obviously for the estuary, for the Delft, for Susan Marsh, where I do a lot of work, sea level rise is absolutely going to the game changer. Uh, it's going to create some very different environments out there. That is, though, curiously enough, in the place of case of Susan Marsh, I think sea level rise is going to be good for native fish. It just won't be good for the fish that are endangered for all the for ocean going fish essentially. <clears throat> so I'm curious as to what your opinion is on the role of scientists in these kinds of decisions. You painted somewhat a dismal picture of it when <laughs> in terms of the de delta smell and all your work is somewhat being ignored, but um, you know, have you learned any lessons through that whole process? In, <laughs> do you have any advice for, for those of us who are scientists who want to make some positive changes? You know, my advice to scientists who might want to get involved in these things, yeah, you have to be persistent. That's a part of it. Um, I don't know quite why, I, I, this is a flaw of my personality that I can't let things go uh, once I've started something. But that's, so that's part of it. And, and also getting out on public forums, presenting your information. I regularly testify at legislative hearings, for example, and things of this nature where I have an opportunity to present the information that I have. Um, and and th actually, there's, there's nothing like peer-reviewed publications. One of the reasons I'm believable, you know, whether it's in a courtroom or at testifying at a hearing of some sort, is that I have peer-reviewed publications that back up most of what I say. Uh, or at least people can see that I've, I've done the science. So people do believe scientists as long as you're, you've maintained a credible uh, background. And part of this is not to go too far out on a limb too. I get tempted very, at times, to talk about things I really shouldn't talk about just because I'm such a, you know, you get full of yourself and you think, I can mention this. I remember once being asked a question about social justice, which I'm passionate about in lots of ways, but I really don't know much about it. And um, one of my colleagues sort of took me aside and said, do you really want to start asking, answering questions about social justice? And I realized, no, that was not a good idea. So knowing your limits is part of it. But I think uh, being a good scientist and being persistent and being honest at all times about your answers, not trying to, uh, you know, one of the problems you heard about uh, from, uh, before the last from Tim was the idea of combat science and a lot of that is because it comes about because scientists start with a conclusion they're you know they're got their PhDs and everything but you start with a conclusion that supports a particular viewpoint and do and their science is focused on proving that conclusion or getting reaching that same conclusion um, obviously it's better to start from the, the other way 
and that also makes you more objective and more believable in the long run. I don't know. Having tenure sometimes helps a little bit too. Being what? Having tenure. Yes, having tenure helps, yes. <laughs> Though I was doing this before I had tenure, so. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, in your presentation, you had a few slides dedicated to mitigation projects like Yellow Bypass, Nags sure. Ranch. Do you see any downside to that, to those sorts of projects from, from an ecological perspective? Well, you know, you know the, the, the Yellow Bypass projects are a good example of what, you know, what I call reconciliation ecology because you're trying to deal with diverse human interests in the same place. You're trying to get farming make farming compatible with salmon and ducks. Um, and and al also, as well as with its major function, which is for flood control. Um, so in some respects, there's no real downside if it works really well. Uh, but the co it's a very complicated process. It involves a negotiating with lots of different people. And so, uh, and the thing, and, the, and anytime you have dealing with di diverse people, and you rely on stakeholder concordance with your uh, your plans, uh, you know one group of stakeholders, whether the farmers or the environs or whatever, can pull out, and everything falls apart. But if you're an optimi optimist like I am, you figure eventually the good th things that make good sense will work. Uh, and the Yolo Bypass is certainly one of them. Uh, Reoperating dams is another one. But you're always going to be goring somebody's ox when you're out there trying to do things like that. Um, and the downside is it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy and somebody's got to do it. Any other questions? Um, I saw in your presentation you mentioned that there's some thresholds for the salmon. They wanted like 900,000 and right. For the smelt, like in the taking, it was there was a certain certain threshold there. Um, how are those thresholds determined? Are they determined by scientists or are they <laughs> determined by <laughs> politics? <laughs> no, they're not determined by scientists. Actually, that's what's so interesting. The uh, threshold for sal this, this mythical number of 960,000 salmon was written into the Central Valley Improvement Act um, in the 1980s. And I'm not sure how the numbers got there. Some staffer in the state, in the federal government, or, uh, for the for the for Congressman Miller, Mr. Miller, and, and and Senator Bradley stuck it in there as a, as a goal. And it's a very unequivocal goal because it says 890,000 fish, and it has to be fish of wild origin. Um, and that, that's a dream, frankly, because I don't think at, up to that act anybody would have thought about we could possibly get back to that number. And we probably can't, at least not as, as wild fish. And the delta smelt numbers are also, uh, we don't really know how many delta smelt are out there. So everything's based on indices and so forth. There are some wild guesses out there what they are. So the goals are set by staff of the, of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And they, you know, it's like, the, like for the pumps this year, it's, a, I don't get the exact number, it's about 300 fish is all they're allowed to kill. Um, and you know th that number there's no really great science behind it but you got to have some kind of a, a limit you got to figure out otherwise the pump they'll just keep taking more and more um, and so it reflects the fact that delta smelt numbers are very low and so you pick a fairly low number <laughs> I, I wish i could give you a more straightforward answer on that but there's not uh, and actually, that's where the, it's the staff, though, who, in the case of the Fish and Wildlife Service, who pick those numbers, do know a lot about the fish. And so they are trying to pick numbers they think are realistic. But, in the, but ultimately, come down to being um, fairly, uh, I wouldn't say arbitrary, but, they're, but they're, there's actually a wide range of potential numbers you could choose from. But they have to choose. They're the regulatory agency. <laughs> Or give me any answers. <laughs> there we go. Scare them out of I was I was surprised by the extent to which um, 
you think that dams can be worked around and can be reoperationalized to to make habitat okay for fish. So I was hoping you could maybe talk a little bit about what all can be done with dams in place and where the limits are. Well, um, the, the question is what can be done with these dams uh, for reoperation? Well, the, the, the and there's actually a lot. Um, the key thing for any any dam increasingly is going to be cold water. That's the one good thing that dams can do for fish. In, a, in the era of climate change, dams, especially big dams, can store a lot of cold water. And as you have your release points at the bottom of the dam, you can release cold water. So during the warm times of the year, when the cold water is in short supply, you have a source of it. So as, for dams, as much as anything, it's not so much the total amount of water they can release downstream, but the temperature of that water is very important. And each stream is going to be different. I mean, Pitta Creek, for example, is drying up, so any water you put down the creek would have been an improvement. Uh, and that's true for quite a few other uh, streams in the state, too. So but by manipulating the water supply that comes out of dams, by, by creating a flow regime that benefits the native fish, by creating cold water, by, and, and combining that with habitat improvements below the dams, which you often have to do because the dams are, like, are capturing all the gravel, for example, that would normally wash downstream. All these things you have to work, have to work together. But there's a, each dam, say, each dam is a little bit different and you have to work with that particular dam to figure out how can you make it function best for whatever fish you want down below it. Does that answer your question? Well, what about connectivity? Below the dam? What Okay, that, that, that's a big issue that the National Marine Fisheries Service is trying to deal with. Uh, obviously, you saw that, remember that figure from early in the talk, the same one that Jay showed before, uh, that most of the, you know, 70% of all the former ha salmon and steelhead habitat is above dams. And it's above dams that don't have ladders on them, so it's shut off to those fish. Uh, that's a huge amount of habitat that could be available. Now, some, some is replaced by the releases below the dams, but it, it's a relatively small amount. Um, the way the National Marine Fishing Service has talked about dealing with this in part is trapping and trucking, where you trap adult fish below the dam, spring run Chinook salmon, for example, you truck them above the dam into their former spawning grounds and let them spawn, and then you have to find some way to trap those young fish and haul them around the dam again and release them downstream. Because if the fish flow into a reservoir, they get eaten by bass and so forth. So it's, that's a terrific problem. And that, frankly, is not a scenario I like very well. Uh, it's a scenario of desperation of species like winter runch and oak salmon where all of their habitat is above dams. And if you want to have more than one, um, all their former habitats above dams. If you want to have more than one population as a winter runch and next salmon, that's pretty much what you're left to do. But trying to catch those small salmon coming downstream, because they're moving down during spring floods, for example, <coughs> is not easy. Uh, it's a very difficult task. But connectivity is what we'd all like. But the fact is that the California dam system makes that very, very hard to do. Hi, Peter. Um, I have a question about hatchery fish. And uh, lately, the trend is to try to release them further and further down the watershed in the bay, mm -hmm. practically dumping them in the ocean uh, as smolts. Um, what, what happens to their behavior, and where do they try to return to? It, they obviously don't have the, the apparatus to get back to their native uh, birth grounds or hatchery because they didn't come down the river. What what happens to those fish? Well, they they, they managed to make it. You know, those fish that are released as juveniles are trucked downstream or moved downstream. So the, so they you know you know well for us should know this, but salmon imprint on the on the stream that they're moving down. They they know the smell of their natal stream, and they memorize essentially as they migrate downstream the pathway they've gone down, so they can go back up it again as adults. It's really quite remarkable. Well, you, obviously you're creating a problem for the fish if you throw them in a truck at, at the hatchery and then truck them down to the delta. You do that because the survival rates are much higher. Uh, what happens though to those fish, they don't know where to go when they come back. So they, want, they, they, they know enough to come back to, to, the, to, the, to the delta, or oh, even then they can spread around. But then they, 
they, they go up, it, they, they, you find fish from uh, different hatcheries in every river in, in the Central Valley. So that has resulted in this salmon population, that's essentially one population, all these fish are pretty much the no number what hatchery they came from or what river they're spawning in are the same genetic fish. And that's created a very uniform fish and that's what's giving you these, these wild fluctuations in, in numbers because they're behaviorally, they're also uh, very limited. So these fish wander and they're genetically, they're semi-domesticated fish. Uh, I don't know if that completely answers the question, but it, it's, uh, it's a complicated issue. Well, I think we'll, we'll stop formal questioning there. Um, the dinner tonight is going to be back at the Gun Rock Cafe, not where we were last time, but back where we've always been. We have room for additional uh, UC Davis students to tag along if you'd like, um, so you're welcome. Um, we'll go there right afterwards. And thank you again, Peter, for a wonderful thank talk you. as usual.